I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. We have a special guest in the studio today. Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest is here. How you doing, my friend? Thanks for having me, buddy. You bet. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Absolutely. Away. This is your first time to Sweetwater. Absolutely, yeah. It's just been a, a, an amazing experience. What an education. Right. Didn't know anything like this ever existed, so it's great. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I got to tell you, British Steel, Screaming for Vengeance, that's like the music of my people, man. It's, it's the music that uh, looms large in my legend, if you will. It's got to be just a thrill to be playing with those guys. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm, we're part of the same tribe. You know what I'm saying? We're part of the same community. Right. Uh, they were iconic albums, and British Steel, I think, was uh, conceived the same year I was born. Mm -hmm. So it was right there from the very beginning. And you know, Scream for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith, and Turbo, and Painkiller, and all those classic albums were just part of my musical makeup as a guitar player, you know, so being in the band, you can imagine, right. it's like, you'd say a dream come true, it's a bit cliche, but that's really what it is, and they're even more heroes of mine now, knowing them on an internet le intimate level mm -hmm. as people and as brothers, you know what I mean, so it's just right. an incredible experience. All right, so you joined the band in 2010, correct? 2011, early 2011. 11, okay. Yeah. And how did, how did that happen? What was the story there? Did you audition? Did they seek you out? It was, um, I got the phone call um, from the management, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they were, fortunately for me, they were a bit persistent. They sent me uh, an email, they sent me two emails about a week apart, and uh, I deleted them. You know, the, the email flies into your inbox, and it's a name, it was the management name, I didn't recognize that, and it was, the subject matter was Judas Priest. I just thought it was a, a, a mail out from, you know, Blabbermouth or, you know, one of these sites that you go on to. Sure. Um, they called me, as I said, fortunately, they were persistent. They called me up and said, uh, you know, do you check your emails? <laughs> and when I looked in the deleted box, there they were, you know what I mean? Right. And I, I mean, I've said it before, but can you imagine finding those emails after the fact, someone else, there's a new guy in Judas Priest, fantastic, good for them, and then you find those emails and it could have been you, you know what I mean? You'd right. be a bit sick, but um, luckily it worked out. I went to see the guys up at Glenn's house, very, very relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, just like this really, and they, they spoke about what they wanted from a guitar player, what I wanted. Uh, they wanted someone who was in the band, not a hired gun, they wanted someone who's got opinions and th their own thing, you know? Right. Um, and we went from there, really. And I think, again, growing up on British Steel and Screaming for Vengeance and the, the mindset of not only Judas Priest, but the metal fraternity in, in general, you knew that um, you, you stood up for what you believe in and you, you might be against the grain or whatever, but you do what you do. And that kind of mindset, I think, uh, permeated into not only the music, but the, the uh, relationships as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we were on the same page musically and, and, and personally. So it just seemed to mesh really well. Right. So did you really have to audition then or was it just the conversation and meeting with them they were already pretty well familiar with what you were doing? Initially it was a conversation. I mean there's millions of guitar players and there's millions of guitar players better than I am and I think that you know a lot of what they do is on the road uh, an, an airport or a tour bus or you in close vicinity with each other for extended periods of time. Sure. And I think a, a big part of that is being able to get along and be bros. You know mm -hmm. get along with each other on those tours um, so again, I think that was an important thing for them. So we got that out of the way first, and it seemed to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went up into the studio, and Glenn asked me to play a few things, and he actually said he, he felt a bit embarrassed asking me to play stuff, because he said he, he wouldn't know. He, he said if someone asked me, uh, himself, um, what to play, he, he wouldn't have a clue what to play. Right. Uh, and I said to him, basically, I've been playing guitar for a long time. Mm -hmm. If I can't think of anything to play now, I might as well quit, you know what I mean? This is the, this is the chance of a lifetime. So I thought of a few things to play pretty quickly, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, yeah, so, but again, it was very relaxed, very, um, you know, just very personable, and it was just a great relaxed atmosphere, so mm -hmm. it was great. And it wasn't very long before you were on stage at American Idol making your debut. I think it was about a month. Yeah. It was about a month before we, uh, we went official with it, and it was about a month later. Uh, we were actually mid-rehearsal, so rehearsals had already started. Um, I'd already been fitted up for the superhero costume, you know, the leather and the studs, which is another <laughs> right. thing completely, it was just phenomenal. Um, and yeah, then you're playing in front of 30 million people, you know, for your first show, so there's no pressure there whatsoever. None, but, yeah. but you just, again, you know what the band stands for, you know what that sort of exposure means. Mm -hmm. um, they've always been, to me, they've always been about flying the flag for British heavy metal, and playing in front of 30 million people in the States alone was a perfect opportunity to do that, you know, with or without me. If I wasn't there, it, it would have been the same. It would have been a great thing for them to do. Uh, so there we were in front of 30 million people, and you just get your head down and you do it. You know, right, so 
right. Now, did you launch right away into the Epitaph tour then after that? Pretty much. We went back to the UK for about another week of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. And then the first show was, um, yeah, as I said, about a week after that, we flew out to Holland, I think it was. Don't remember much of the first show. Yeah. The second one I remember a lot of. Um, the first show was a warm-up show. I think it was about three, 4,000 people. Um, the second show was in Sweden Rock, and it was about 30,000. So we got the warm-up out of the way, that, you know, and then it was the first big show. And it was the first, one of the first moments that I remember thinking, holy cow, this is, this is real, you know. Rob came out on the bike, and we had this 40 foot, 50 foot ego ramp out into the crowd, which we don't normally have, but as it was a festival crowd, we were headlining a festival, we had the use of the, the ego ramp. So he, he got on the Harley, as he does, and he drove it down this ego ramp. And I was standing there on stage looking out at 30, oh, I said million, <laughs> 30 million people, 30,000 people, um, and Halford at the end of the ego ramp on this massive great bike with the blue smoke and the flashing lights. It was raining, you know, as I said, the blue smoke, and he had his horns in the air, and there was 30,000 people with their horns in the air as well. And it was just one of those moments where you think, yeah, this, this is... This is happening, right. you know what I mean? And that right. will stick with me forever, I think. I bet. Yeah, man. I bet. Now, you had been on uh, bigger stages already. You had been touring with bands and opening for acts and doing some of those things as well. So it wasn't a total, like, they hadn't taken you from the bedroom straight to, the, straight to that big stage. No, people often ask me that. They, uh, you know, how did you deal with that kind of uh, audience? And you never go from a club to, you know, an enormous dome. It, it's a gradual sort of uh, journey. Mm -hmm. So you get used to each... Um, uh, scenario, mm -hmm. thankfully. But right. yeah, I've been on a road before with Lauren Harris, Steve from uh, Iron Maiden's daughter. Mm -hmm. We played some big, uh, big places opening for Maiden. But it was, you can imagine, it was a different sort of dynamic. You know, we're the main band now and sure. people were there to see you. But there was also that kind of, there was a, with Lauren, you had to get out there and get a new audience, people that didn't know you. And that was a similar dynamic with Priest for me, at least, because I was a new guy. I had to get out there. They were there, they'd paid their tickets and they'd come to see the band they love. But I also had a point to prove, and it was a healthy point. It wasn't like a, you know, I need to show people. What. It was, you know, it was a healthy point to prove. So there was right. that dynamic in Priest, and it still is. We still go to places around the world where, not, we went to New Zealand, I think last year. Priest had never been to New Zealand. Hmm. So it was the first time for Priest, and then also it was the first time for me in some territories as well. So there's always that, when I say points to prove, it's not a negative one. It's, a, you know, the band's are alive and well, and... There's a new guy, but it's, it, we're still rocking hard, you know what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. It's got that dynamic still. Sure, sure. So talk a little bit about, uh, I, I like to ask this when someone's coming into an established band, and obviously K.K. Downing had, had worked for 40 years or so with the, with the group. Do you feel a lot of pressure to recreate what he did? Do you feel like you should be doing your own thing to put your stamp on it? How do you approach that? It's a good question. I mean, um, I think Ken was a sort of player. He was a Hendrix fan as well, uh, and I am. And I think the way Hendrix played and in turn the way Ken played was there was an element of improvisation to the way, you know, it was never the same twice. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you play certain motifs from classic solos, but you inject your own personality in there as well. Hendrix was like that. I think that's what I got from Ken's playing live. And I've always been that sort of player anyway. Um, you know, I've been in cover bands all my life, so you kind of make it interesting sure. for yourself and you, you get certain motifs out of classic solos and then you do your own thing and it, it was an extension of that really you've got to be respectful to what went before mm -hmm. but again knowing the mindset of you've got to carve your own niche in the world which they did and you've got to fly that flag as well so being respectful to what went before you but carving a bit of your own sound in there as well if possible it's a hard thing to do you know what i mean um but you do it as much as you can and, sure. and still i do it every night classic so even the solos that i've got on redeemer of souls they're different every night, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's, it's that, I'm that kind of player, you know, you, you throw your own flavor in every night, depending on the crowd, the energy, where you are, you, and you know, what you're feeling at the time. So it's very organic, and it, it's always been a part of my playing since I was young, really. Sure, sure. Uh, speaking of Redeemer of Souls, uh, Rob Halford has been fairly vocal about you coming into the band and really re-energizing and revitalizing things. You went into the studio with them to write and record Redeemer of Souls. Tell us a little bit about that dynamic, because obviously they've been writing songs together as a unit for a long time, and, uh, and you're coming in with fresh ideas. Well, I think Rob's given me too much credit, man. <laughs> I, I think they, uh, you know, there's five guys in the band. They've been doing it for 40 years because of their... I mean, you can't deny it. You can't do something for 40 years without being passionate about it. So they need to give themselves more credit for that. You know what I mean? I'm part of that. Great. And, uh, you know, it, it's great. I'm grateful that he can say that. Mm -hmm. And he means it, you know. But 
Um, it's great to be a part of that and people, fans are saying, you know, the band's been rejuvenated and there's a new energy, which I can only thank them for really, but everyone involved is, is responsible for that, you know. Um, coming into the studio environment, we'd already done the Epitaph tour, which is the best part of two years around the world, and you'd kind of got to know the guys and built up a rapport, as I said, on the road or in an airport. You spend a lot of time together. Uh, and in the live scenario as well, so you're playing classic songs by one of your favourite bands, and then you get into the studio and it was like the next level of, okay, I've been accepted on this level, it's the next level now, now you're going to create with a band. And they wanted to keep it the same as they always have, i.e. the two guitar player, vocalist, writing team. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I wasn't bringing anything, I wasn't going to bring anything to the table that wasn't suitable. I know the band, I know what they stand for, I grew up with them. Um, and to the point where you're in bands in school and you, you can't play that, That's, that sounds like Priest. But right. now you can, you know, you can bring all those out, you know, if something comes out and it sounds like Priest, put it on the table. And even when it didn't, even if it was slightly bluesy or Hendrixy, again, I'm a big Hendrix fan, um, if it makes sense and it sounds good and it was a good song idea, we, we'd go with it. So it was very sort of open to ideas, very creative. Um, and again, Glenn and Ken as guitar players came from Hendrix and Rory Gallagher and Priest kind of came from the progressive blues, mm -hmm. you know. So again, if it was a bluesy element and it made sense, and it made sense in the in the history of the band's sound, we went with it, you know. So again, it was very freeing, very open, very creative, and we did, we came up with around twenty songs. It was incredible, and uh, so and it was great to watch these guys, the way that, that they work, and they're they're like us, you know. They we come up with ideas, and they're open. Again, they ask for your opinion, what have you got, Should we, let's put it together. You're on the same page and it was a team effort. It wasn't, well, this is who we are and this is the way we're doing it. And right. It wasn't that, it was what have you got? Mm -hmm. What can we do? How should we do this? And it's been like that from day one, to be honest with you. Right. Um, but on the, in the creative sense, in the studio, it, it was very much an extension of that. So, um, yeah, it was a creative atmosphere and all, there were no restrictions. Mm -hmm. There was no, I think they've got the concept album out of their system with Nostradamus. Mm -hmm. So there was no, if there was any concept to be had with this, the last record, it was let's just do what Judas Priest does from the heart. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm saying it again, but growing up with the band, it came from my heart too. It wasn't faked, it wasn't, oh, I've got to write for Judas Priest. Right. It, was, it came from the heart and we all done it and we put you know, our souls on the line. Mm -hmm. um, and we came out with a record and it seemed to be the right approach to have. So. Sure. Just a great education again. Well, it's obvious because it sounds authentic. It does. You know, it doesn't sound like there's, it's not, you know, as you say. So clearly yeah. it's, a, it's natural for you. Absolutely, yeah. So you, uh, you mentioned Jimi Hendrix. Um, you've also talked about uh, Zach Wilde and Michael Schenker as being mm -hmm. big influences for you. What do you take from those guys? Um, note choice. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've never been a shredder. You know, first of all, I can't shred. You know what I mean? Um, but I've always been attracted to note choice and technique and melody um, and spacing in between notes. Mm -hmm. And the more so, the older I get. Um, so Schenker was out with us um, in December of last year and I watched him every night and it was a masterclass in all those things, technique, melody, note choice, spacing. It was just phenomenal to watch that. Um, and Zach to me has always been the same type of thing, mm -hmm. Gilmore. Um, Dave Murray from Iron Maiden, Adrian Smith, those sort of players, not the super shredder players, but the, you know what I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. the other, somewhere in the middle right. um, type of players. And it's, it's never, been a, never been a secret who they are, you sure. know what I mean, I wear them on my sleeve really. Um, and it's a constant evolution trying to, you know, take from those guys and try and do, trying to do your own thing, trying to do your own note choice and make things interesting and unique. Um, you know, that, that's a challenge in itself, as I said earlier on. It's a hard thing to do to have your own sound, I find. Right. Um, but yeah, they, they were always guys to me that were saying things with what they were playing. It wasn't about how many notes they were playing, it was about what they were saying with those notes. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, any, any sort of player like that where you can, Slash is another one, you know, Randy Rhodes, all those guys where you can, I don't know, there's, there's something, it's like the way you talk. Mm -hmm. If you spoke after 10 coffees, you might not make a lot of sense, but if you, you know, you really, put your foot down and you said your point. It's kind of like the same analogy with the guitar playing. Right. And I just get a lot more from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Speaking of your own sound, uh, Schenker, of course, is well known for putting a wah-wah in one position, and you use a wah a pedal as well, but I was very interested to watch you use it, because you're not just putting it in one spot, you're kind of subtly moving it and using it to shape the tone, not so much as a wah-wah-wah effect, but to really kind of shape the phrases as you're playing them. T can you talk a little bit about that? That's amazing you noticed that. Is, uh, yeah, I've never liked the the wah 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 thing. Mm -hmm. It's and and the Schenker thing is the Schenker thing, so you can't leave it there, right? Because it's Schenker. But yeah, it kind of it's like an expression. It's like a, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, like another voice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Rather than the wah wah wah. Um, and I just I just feel like it cuts through here, gives it a bit more flavour. It's just another form of expression rather than just the flat notes. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, always been like that. And the wah pedal is such an expressive thing in itself, and so many people use it in so many different ways. Um, you know, people hear different things. It's, it's an incredible piece of kit, really. Mm -hmm. um, always been attracted to the wah pedal. Again, Schenker, you know, Kirk Gamet, and you know, all, all those guys, Zach, obviously. Right. And it's another fingerprint of a guitar player is the way that they use their wah. So, um, you know. Right, fantastic! You noticed that. Well, you use, very very you use it very differently than, than any of those guys do. It's, a, it's cool. a subtle thing. In fact, uh, if you're not watching, you do it. You almost just hear the tone shaping. And part of that also is I noticed you're very mobile with your right hand as you play. You're back by the bridge. You're up over the front pickup. You're in the middle. Is there a conscious thought that directs where you're picking along the length of the string to generate certain harmonics and certain tonal shapes? I don't even know. That's a good point. That's a good <laughs> question. I'm going to think about it now. Um, I think there is. There's a certain feel at the back of the bridge, and there's a certain feel here. It's a bit, a uh, bit more spongy here, a bit more. Um, I don't know the term to use. It's a bit harsher back here, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a natural thing, and uh, the incredible thing is as well. You get people on social media now analyzing what you do, and they're telling me what I like, circular picking. I've no idea what that is, and people are saying you circular pick and it's news to me you just mm -hmm. you know i'm not a technical guy i don't know right. what the terms are you just do what you do and if i'm playing here or there there's a reason i'm doing it i couldn't tell you why but it's, it's a, a feel thing you know mm -hmm. um but yeah and this you know alternative picking and picking every note and that sort of thing there's so many different again fingerprints of what people do and i just do what do what comes naturally you know mm -hmm. if you sat hendrix down and said you know what scales or what modes or what technique he couldn't tell you either you just right. done again what came from the heart, and that's how I'm getting away with it, <laughs> you know, right. Right. without knowing the terminology. So, you know. Sure, sure. Well, to take it even a step further, I, I, I noticed that you have kind of two hand positions when you're playing solos. You put the thumb on the, uh, the pick on the ball of your thumb and hold it this way with your fingers curled under, but then you'll also slip the pick back toward the joint, which extends your fingers out straight and you tend to, uh, to shift those. And there are certain phrases that you're playing. It, again, is that something that's conscious, it, where you're trying to shape it by moving your hand position and you're hearing something? Or? It's not conscious until now. Thanks. <laughs> 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 now I've blown it for you, right? Yeah. You're we, we thinking about it every time? Yeah, I, would, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have even been able to tell you that. I, wouldn't, I, I don't know I'm doing that. Sure. It's more of a feel thing. I mean, even down to you know the pickups and the guitars that you use and the necks and what it is, uh, whatever kind of combination of stuff you use or the techniques you use, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost down to if you can forget what you're doing or you can forget without, I'm trying not to sound spinal tap here, but it's like if you can forget, I'm not, I'm not succeeding, am I? <laughs> um, no, you, if, you, if you let it become unconscious. Unconscious. Then it kind of happens. Yeah. Exactly. You go on autopilot and I, I'm kind of glad in a way that I can't tell you what Mm -hmm. what I do and you know it's more of a testament to it's coming from another place and I'm not thinking about it and it's, it's coming out of where I think it should be coming rather than oh, this is the technique I'm using for this kind of sound or this is the it's more of an organic thing mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, if, I feel like I'm a shrink or something. And I've been, I'm sorry. I'm, I've been analyzing. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm analyzing you. No, well, no. What's cool about it, though, and, and the reason I bring it up is because a lot of times when players are playing and they have a higher gain tone and they're 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 working metal styles or shredder styles and things, mm -hmm. they're they've practiced so much they're super consistent and the mm -hmm. tone is super consistent as they play, and that's a, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But you have a lot of tonal shaping to what you play is what really stood out to me listening to your playing, which is why I bring all that up. Gotcha. Well, uh, yeah. Again, I think one of the, the things about shredders is they are consistent. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything I'm not, it's consistent, you know. But, uh, you know, Schenker isn't, you know, it's different mm -hmm. all the time. Ken wasn't and Hendrix wasn't, you know what I mean? So, sure. um, again, I've never been attracted to that kind of style of guitar playing. It's fantastic what people do. I, can't, I couldn't even begin, you know what I mean? Right. But, um, yeah, the consistency to me is just, it becomes routine. 
You know what I mean? And uh, I think if you're thinking about, I mean, it works for, it works for millions of players around the sure. world, but for me, if I think too much about what I'm doing, it doesn't really work. You know, I'd rather just throw it up there and mm -hmm. sound wise, or as I said, uh, equipment wise, technique wise, I couldn't tell you. Sure. But um, it seems to work, luckily. Absolutely. So, uh, right, right, right. Did you have lessons? Did you have any formal training? I didn't. Um, I, my dad showed me a couple of chords mm -hmm. when I was a kid. I think it was E and A or something like that. Um, and I worked out B. It was like Wild Thing. It was like a. It, w it was in the wrong key, but it was. I worked out the progression for Wild Thing and it sort of cracked a code. It, you know, uh, quite early on. But it took a while. Uh, but completely self-taught. And you know, back in the days of the the stylus on the on the vinyl, you'd kept you kept having to move it back over the mm -hmm. ridges to learn the part and back again. And, and that was basically what it was. Um, it was you know. Hendrix and Purple, Sabbath, um, and then sort of moved on to Metallica, Priest, Maiden. That was the next level of it. Um, fortunately, mm -hmm. you know, um, right. you can't see the, you know, no one's got a crystal ball, no one can see the future, but that was the right path to take, you know. Um, so, yeah, no formal training, but there's, there's a wealth of stuff online now, you know, uh, inspirational players, and they talk through what they do and how they do it and how they achieve their tones and techniques and stuff like that. So, right. as a young player growing up now, I mean, you can be totally self taught now. There's a wealth of information out there now, which I didn't have when I was a kid, and obviously, the, my generation before me didn't have either. But, um, yeah, again, it, it seemed to work for me, mm -hmm. that, you know, self taught, and you find your own patterns and find your own things that work for you, and uh, yeah. Right. Right. Well, you mentioned crystal ball, so I just have to make this segue. Mm -hmm. You uh, worked on a project with Saruman, uh, uh, Dracula, Christopher Lee. Yeah, I did. Doing a project. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was really surreal. I was uh, I was with w working with Lauren Harris at the time, and we were off the road, and I was living in one of Steve Harris's houses. And I don't know if you know about Steve Harris. He's got Eddie's from previous tours on the driveway. So there I am with Eddie in the driveway, and. Sir Christopher booming out of the speakers. And I don't know what the neighbours must have thought, but it was, it, as you know, Sir Christopher's got a very commanding voice. And, uh, and he was singing, half narrating, half singing. And it was just a surreal, again, surreal experience to be a part of. He was a sweetheart, lovely guy. We met up a few times and different, he was from a different era, different generation, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just amazing to hear someone else from that. What he's done, I mean, outside of the, the film industry, you know, what he's done in his personal life is just stunning, you know what I mean? Right. And just hearing someone's wealth of knowledge and from a different generation with that much authority was just incredible, you know. Uh, sweetheart, I mean, you know, he'll be missed, but he was one of the greats of our sure. generation. So, uh, right, right. again, I'll keep saying this, but it was just a great education, great experience, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, what fun. So it, uh, it interests me that uh, when I first was, was uh, you know, checking you out online and watching some of your playing and things, and you talk a lot about Hendrix, one would expect you'd be leaning towards Stratocasters, but then of course you talk about Zach and, and uh, Michael Schenker, and, mm -hmm. and you're a Gibson guy. Yeah. Well, the Strat has always been a magical instrument to me. It's, it's kind of one of the, it's the first thing I saw Hendrix play. Mm -hmm. um, and I started off playing Stratocasters. I had like a Strat copy, I can't remember what it was. Um, but I s gravitated towards the Gibsons because it was the tool that I was getting what I wanted from. I couldn't tell you what that was, but it wasn't a conscious decision, mm -hmm. I'm going to play those now. It was, I played some ones and I, this feels good and kind of went from there. I, I've still got Stratocasters a bit, and they are still kind of like, um, I look at them in a different way. A, a Gibson to me is a magical instrument, but it's more of a tool for me, whereas a Strat is more of a, a mystical creation, just because it, I think it was the first guitar that I ever saw someone play that really made that impact on me uh, as a listener right. uh, and as a kid, and that was Hendrix. And again, the Strat to me has got to be upside down. Whether you're left-handed or right-handed, it's got to be upside down. It just looks like, it doesn't look like even a Strat anymore. It looks like something else, a mystical creature, as I said. So, right. But I love the Gibbos, I love the Gibsons, uh, the Les Pauls and the Vs are the main uh, guitars of choice. Uh, this is one that Gibson made for me, and I've just been customising it um, as we go through the tour. You know, double scratch plates and different pickups, and I've taken the taken the tone knobs off of it. Um, obviously, the Floyd Rose and that, and uh, yeah, Les Pauls and Flying V's, is Randy Rhodes and Michael right. Schenker and Zach, and you know all those guys. Right. Um, and it's they do the job. You know what I mean? Just, do you I find you play them. different on the two? Do you play a Strat versus when you play a Les Paul? Do you hear a big difference in your pl own playing? 
Good question. I don't know. It definitely feels, well, you start playing Hendrix, you get a strat and you start playing Hendrix. For right. it, you know. um, and there's definitely a call for it. You know, if you're coming up with ideas, you're writing stuff, and uh, it's like playing a piano or whatever. You, you play a different instrument, you come up with different, uh, you know, you're inspired different ways. And the strat is one of those things. If I'm playing a Les Paul or a V at home, and I'm putting down some ideas, pick up a strat, and it will inspire something completely different. Mm -hmm. So maybe I do, yeah, again, I haven't really thought about it, but now you're asking me, <laughs> I'm gonna need a, a session after this, you know. Um, but yeah, it does definitely inspire different things, so yeah, I'd say so. Right, right. So what's next? You mentioned you were coming here from the studio on your way actually, and here, is there new music on the horizon? What's happening? There is with Priest, there's, uh, we're putting together a new record. I just flew straight back out of the UK, straight to Sweetwater. We've just been in the studio for a couple of months mm -hmm. um, putting songs together. We haven't started the recording process yet, but we're recording demos, recording songs that work without the production to save them, if you know what I mean. Sure. But at the core value, we're putting down some grassroots ideas and fleshing them out for the next Priest record. So mm -hmm. we're going to go into the studio to start recording in January. Nice. So it should be out sometime next year. And then, uh, but we're not touring next year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be touring hopefully 2018. So the album will come out next year. So. So next year, um, I'm starting to put together a bit of an event, a bit of a, a bit of a guitar event. And you know, I saw this thing uh, about Stradivarius violins, mm -hmm. and you know, they're, they've created some of the most beautiful music the world's ever known. But what's happening is people are buying them as an investment and putting them in a bank vault. And the same's starting to happen with vintage guitars, and no one's hearing. You know, when Jimmy Page played the '59 Les Paul, that's not being experienced anymore. So the idea is loosely based around that, getting these guitars out of bank vaults, mm -hmm. putting them in a scenario where people can experience them, people can hear them. Um, and again, I keep talking about the tribe that we're all a part of. We're all guitar nuts, we're all music nuts, and whether you're a drummer or a guitar player, whatever, you, the guitar is an integral part of music for the, the last 50, 60 years. You know? sure. So it's getting those guitars out of retirement and into where I believe they should be. You know, and it's gonna, you know, it's all about that. So it's all about getting uniting the tribe, getting the people together, uh, and it's we're calling it cult of guitar because that's what we're a part of. It's a cult of guitar. We're nuts. We're all nuts. We're nerds. Uh, inviting some friends down, getting their guitars out, t talking about why they play them. Mm -hmm. You know, why it's got one volume knob, why it's got this, why it's got that, why they choose to play it, who turned them onto guitar, and then having a, a big old you know uh, jam at the end with some friends coming down. Nice. So. Um, so yeah, we're looking at, I'm looking at getting that together for next year. So you'd have to come down and I'd get up to. and do a couple of songs to. with us. Yeah, I'd love that. That'd be, that'd be an honor. That'd be great. So, so it's a live event. Are you going to record this? Or are you going to put it on video? Or are you going to? It's going to be a touring event. Oh, we're nice. we're going to tour it around. Nice. Hopefully. Um, so there's, you know, part of it is that, that obviously there are these idyllic instruments that we all listen to and we all know when you put on your record player, there's the 59 or that's the 63 Strat, whatever. But um, there's also right across the gamut, you know, you, it's all in your fingers. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have one of these. This is what we all grew up on. Right. But you can have, you know, an Epiphone or you can put a guitar, you can have Brian May's Red Special. It's all in the fingers. So it goes right from these revered instruments, right to you can take something away from it and go and do your own thing on a guitar that you create if you want or, you know, it costs a couple of hundred bucks, whatever it is. It's not mm -hmm. about that at the end of the day. It's about you and what you know, statement you want to make on the guitar. And again, it's a coming together of, of the, the clan that, you know, I'm a part of and you're a part of and right. while we're all doing this, you know, again, whether you're a drummer or a keyboard player, the guitar is a, an integral part of that. So right. it should be an exciting thing. Oh, that's going to be fun. So you're here at Sweetwater doing a recording workshop in Studio A with Mark Hornsby and they brought a band in. Tell us what you're doing there. Well, basically what it is, um, there's uh, an educational component mm -hmm. to, to what we do. And again, I'm fairly new to it, and in a position where I feel like I can give back to the people that have helped put me there, or the industry that's helped put me where I am at the moment, you know what sure. I mean? And it's part of that. We've done um, the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp in LA about two months ago, and it was just, I couldn't tell you the experience. When people are up there on stage, and they're all ages, all walks of life, bankers to kids at school, they're all, you know, they're learning songs and they're with you. And it was just, they, they're looking at you, they're asking you for advice and they're scared and you're with them and you're, you're helping them through it. Um, it was just an amazing feeling. You know, you look over at one of the kids 
you know, he's scared out of his mind, but he starts to rock and he gets goosebumps on his arm and you think, yeah, that, that's what it's about, you know what I mean? And this is an extension of it. So this time at Sweetwater, it was a, um, the other side of the desk type thing. Guys and girls here, they're learning uh, production techniques and, you know, engineering techniques and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm part of the band that they were recording to learn those techniques. And uh, again, being a part of that, to pass on some of the knowledge. I'm not an engineer or a producer by any means, but I know that, you know, I'm familiar with the studio process. And if they can get something from that, and there's four of us, four great musicians in there with a great song. And uh, hopefully they can come out of this, you know, a bit more educated on what to do or inspired into their next project or whatever it is. So again, it's an extension of that educational process and passing on the knowledge, the limited knowledge sometimes, but you know, if it can help in any way, mm -hmm. go for it. So that's what this was really. And it's just been a, an eye-opening experience again, you know. Right, what a great opportunity to come in and have an industry veteran with so much experience and, and uh, knowledge to share to be able to come in and take part in that is really awesome. Well, I'm humbled you say that. I'm not a veteran yet. I'm working on it, but uh, you know, working with the veterans around here mm -hmm. and the whole, the whole complex is just a, an eye-opener. Oh, I didn't you. know anything like this existed, and it's just great to see so many positive people doing what we do mm -hmm. in various aspects of the industry. We're all here as a big team, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we're all, again, we're all the same tribe, we're all in the same family. Whatever music it is, whatever stage of the industry it is, never knew anything like this existed. So it's, right. it's you know, eye-opening. Well, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for taking some time out and uh, talking with us and sharing some of your awesome playing. It was, it's uh, thank really you, just a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mitch. Great to meet you. Thank you, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. And thank you for joining me for Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. I'm Mitch Gallagher.